This is a Anything Goes podcast production. All right, all right, you guys. Welcome back to another episode of the Journey of a Soul Sister. If you ain't already following me, just look me up on all platforms. You can. You looking for a podcast home? Digital Impact Studios is where you need to be. I ain't gonna tell you again. You see my books in the back. They will be also on the screen. Available at Amazon and Barnes and Noble. But enough of that little shameless plug stuff that I do, right? Let's take these headphones off because, of course, my guest said I look goofy. But it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it is all right. Let me tell y'all something. He drove about two and a half hours down here. About two and a half hours. Yeah, two and a half hours. I've been, you know, peeping him on the scene for a little while. We have mutual friends. He has a podcast. An awesome one, by the way. I tell you guys, it's Beards and Bottles. You can find them on all streaming platforms. And also on Patreon, if you haven't already tuned that in. part, that part. But again, we've been following. I just been seeing his interview style, his story, it get me even more intrigued. But then out of the blue, he hit me up and he said, "I want to come to your show. I want to come to your show. I like how you're talking now. My show? Oh man, right? I said, okay, well, dope. Let's set it up. So not only is he a man of his word, right. say he want to do something, he gonna do it. Not only did he pick the date and the time, and it didn't bother him that it was two and a half hours away to come sit down with the goddess legend. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn around to you. <coughs> it's your main man, PBM Louis. Yeah, it's your main man, PBM Louis, uh, Louis J, uh, whatever you know me as. Uh, one half of Beards and Bottles podcast. Uh, also the owner of 10,000 Hours, the network. Uh, we got so much going on. I'm just happy to be here and just participate in whatever you got going on. You know what I mean? I just want to be a, a supporter of what you do. I love that. Thank you so much for coming down here. And I will say this. Since I've met Jersey people, y'all have done nothing but show me love and gratitude. So I right. do appreciate that. So thank you again for just taking that time out right. to sit with Ledger. Oh, man, you're welcome. Now, I don't know if you've been watching me, right? You've been saying... Oh, you get it in it. You know what I mean? I just telling you, like, uh, that we, on the elevator, when we was talking about it, like, your, your interview with your son was, to me, was legendary. You know what I mean? I felt so like much. that was like... um a pinnacle moment, not only just to, you know, watch him, how he speak. Mm -hmm. I mean, he doing his thing. I, I pre, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And then I just felt like it showed growth in you. Yes, you know it did. what I mean? It and, did. and you know, a lot of people are afraid from us to know them personally. Mm -hmm. So, you know what I mean? So I see a son, you know what I mean? And that's on the spectrum and you know what I mean? And able to grow. That's mm -hmm. a beautiful thing, and I respect you for that. that Thank you so much. See, I always say that I'm a part of the solution, and right. you'd be surprised how many people who actually have the same story as you, right. or similar to you, are going down the same path. We always think we're alone, and we always have to hide these things, right. because if we grow up in an era where goes on in the house, stay in the house. You don't speak about these things, and just because it is, most people with disabilities, we pull to just shun upon them and pay them like they're not a real person. Right, right. Never in my life would I ever do that to something I created that I was blessed with. So right. Bad habit, but thank you so much for saying that and being open to share right right so, okay, right so today you always like i want to know the fundamentals and where you come from give me yeah, the backstory. yeah, yeah. we share need to know it i guess your backstory we see what you're doing now all right you got it and i'm right, happy right. for you and i appreciate so, it where did you start where did you come from well um i'm from Irvington, new jersey mm -hmm. um born in and and Mostly raised in Irvington, New Jersey. Also, uh, I lived in Bayonne, New Jersey as well for a short stint, maybe four to six years I lived there. Um, I come from a, a different type of upbringing. So, uh, you know, my mother, I've uh, been having AIDS, HIV since 1998. Mm -hmm. um, met my father 2003 or 2004 when I was 18 years old. Um, my grandma died when I was um, in 98 as well. Um, and that's why I lived with, that was with my caretaker before I went to the foster home. It was my grandmother. Mm -hmm. Um, and we was one of the poorest kids on my block in the area that I come from. It was at, at that time, you know, um, my family came from Texas. My grandmother and them came from Texas and I was born in Newark as well, but I, I moved to Texas for like three or four years. Mm -hmm. And then my grandfather died in 89. So I've been back in New Jersey from 80. I was born in 86. We moved there early. Mm -hmm. Um, I went from 86 to eight, like maybe three or four months when I was born in New Jersey, right down to Texas. And I lived there from 86 to 89, the first three years of my life. My grandfather died, we back on the boat. Mm -hmm. But now, just moving forward um, in my teen years, early, you know, seventh grade, sixth grade, 12 years old, I started gangbanging. So I, st I turned Crip 
uh, like 98, 99, around the same, you know, same things is, around the same time when things start, you know what I mean? Start to really like go downhill for me mm -hmm. and life started to spiral. You know what I mean? So, so stop you there, yeah. right? Because we'll go into that more deeper. So you said your grandmother was your caregiver when you were born here. For sure. Okay. So why did she become your caregiver prior? Uh, my mother, my mother uh, was doing drugs since uh, like the eighties, like you know, mm -hmm. cocaine. You know, when a regular never. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, she was uh, one of them good people that just was. You know what I mean? Was part of that epidemic. You know, a lot of people uh, fell victim to it in the 80s, early 90s. And I also have brothers and sisters as well that's younger than me, but I was her firstborn. My father was a teenager. She was a teenager as well. So usually, you know, when you come from a teen mom, usually the parents of that teen mom take care of the child. Mm -hmm. That was one of those, you know what I mean, one of those guys. Um, and at that time, um, she had me about 17, 18 years old. Um, so it was, it was just a, a wild upbringing, mm -hmm. but I didn't know it was wild because it was your normal. It was my normal. You know what I mean? It's just like somebody's being a Jehovah witness and not getting gifts on Christmas. Exactly. It was the same, the, the, the same thing. So I didn't even know we was poor until I wasn't able to do certain things. Maybe about nine or 10, I started, the realization started to kick in that we were super poor. Other kids are getting sneakers. I can't get sneakers. It's jokes on me because I got holes in my shoes. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Um, saying trust me. Yeah. So, you know. and then, and then, then everybody's moving this way. I couldn't join football because we couldn't afford the equipment. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Just mm -hmm. so you start you to notice that you're poor. Those things, right? And having the relationship with your grandmother because your mother, you know, she was out. I will say addiction streets. is an illness. For sure. People don't understand that. Right. Sometimes when they start off with drugs, it's like a recreational thing, right? Right, right, right. Of course, they had that. So we can't really too much place blame, if that makes sense, because it becomes a chemical imbalance. I think I disagree with you on some okay. on some point. Let me tell you why. So I think uh, initially it's a choice. Mm -hmm. So when you first do it, it's a choice, right? Of course. And then after years come on and you do get clean in your life, Okay. You know what I mean? So now it becomes a choice again. Yes, it's an addiction, but it's controllable by the person. The same way I'm, I'm not, I'm fat and you're not. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm, I'm fat saying. to death. I don't know what she's talking no, about. No, no, no. You know what I mean? <laughs> some people are healthy and some people are not. Yeah, it's an addiction. You got to control it. At the same time, you got a choice to control it. So you it. don't believe that it creates a chemical imbalance? I do. I, do. I believe that it creates a you chemical know, like imbalance. Does that For sure, 100%. I, I, I believe that it does that, what you're saying. But I'm also, I'm still also believe that we got the control enough to fight through it. Okay. But it also depends on a person's mental stability. Sometimes people are not as strong Agreed. as you may think and then support as well. And then do you ever understand that sometimes that's a coping mechanism for certain things? Right. I think that's an excuse. You think that's an excuse? Why yeah. do you think that's an excuse? I think that we could do anything as long as we put our mind to it. Right. I think I feel like if we passionate about it, we can do it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a lot of people say, yo, uh, you can be anything you want to be. That's not true. You can do anything you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. So if you're passionate about getting clean, you're passionate about getting your children back, that should be bigger than the, dr the drugs that you're doing. It should be bigger than the obstacles that you got to go through because it's worth it. At a certain extent. So I agree to disagree with you because I am a product of a person who used to get high and right. drugs and my father. And I can't say that he didn't love us. However, the addiction won. If that makes sense, hundred percent. I'm, I'm never saying they don't love us. Mm -hmm. That's not that's not what the debate about. I'm I'm sure that they loved us. I'm just simply saying if they wanted to, if they get it, gave in the time, gave in the right place, given the right situation, I feel like they had opportunities to be get the clean. right support, like therapy or right. something like that. But do you also know the area that your mother grew up in? Right, therapy, right. And things like that was frowned upon. Right. And like I stated before, what goes on in this house? And I was born in the '80s. I was born '87, so you're right. a year older than me. Right. It was still taught what goes on in this house. Saying it's Stays in so house. let's think about whatever may have transpired between your mother, your grandmother, your grandfather. Not saying that they were bad people. Right, right, they right. Have right. No idea what may have happened to why she needed to cope. Not making excuses because I'm a firm believer I hold people accountable and I do self accountability for myself. Right. But we have to look at it through another person's lens. I think I'm um, not to cut you off. No, I, I think personally, right in my household. As I got older, I found out information that I didn't know before, right? So and some of that information is that people on my side of my family mm -hmm. had uh, mental issues. So they mm -hmm. was going in like mental homes, so on and so yeah. forth. And I think my mother early. Was untreated. Yeah, well, I think early because her sister, that's older than her by one year, mm -hmm. had her baby at 16, mm -hmm. right? And now she's in a mental ward, been there since she was 18 or 19 years old, in and out. You get what I'm saying? And then now... Paranoid, schizophrenic, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, my sister is. She's bipolar. And right. And then my mother, 
as in her older age is starting to show signs. But it's it's hard for me to even see those signs when I'm younger because I grew up with my mother. Of course. You had me at 18. That means by the time you're 28, I'm already 10. We're growing up together. You're still a child at, at, at certain ages. And so after 25, you're kind of still a child. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you feel like you have mother issues? Me have mother issues? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a little, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you. I have no clue. Uh, I think, um, before I married my wife, I've been my wife 12 years. So she's seen, you know what I mean? Yeah. Shout out to my wife. So she's seen me grow, you know what I mean? So many stages in my life. So I, I feel like maybe in the beginning, maybe the first eight years, it was a crazy with me, dealing with me, dealing with women. Cause I still at, at, at this old age, I'm about to be 37 years old. I don't still don't trust nobody. I don't trust no women. I don't trust no men. I don't trust so you anyone. The question. Yeah. I still, so it's still some trust so issues, do. but it's not, I don't know if it's particularly with women. I just think generally because of the so streets you know, with that combined with that kind of, I get it. But you know what they say is your mother is your first teacher, right? We mm. teach you to trust, love, nurture, give you that coming up. That's what they say. Right. And then the men, you guys install the different, the father side, these other aspects that I could never do for my son. Right. Got you. Because I'm not a male. So there's things I could never relate to my boys. I have a 20 year old, so I get it. Mm -hmm. So what I say to you is you still don't trust any one that At all. from childhood so you answered your own question yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. i never even thought about that yeah so yeah. it's probably from my mother or from my father though where's his responsibility so we'll in the situation both. yeah we'll say both right it's from both so you have so that's why you trust no one not just women but also right. that so with you not trusting anyone how was you even able to commit to get married um, I, that took years of growth and development to go back, to swing it back to in the nineties and early two thousands. Like, um, you know, my mother was the prostitute, you know what I mean? She used to, you know what I mean? At, at, and I know my sisters are going to see this and my other sisters, they're going to be mad that I'm saying this. That's so, fine. So, I wrote so, a whole so. book and my family don't speak to yeah, me. Let's go. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my mother used to, you know, sell certain things, but it's when I was eight years old, when they wasn't even born yet, I remember her leaving me outside on a block that I'm from now, mm -hmm. always been all my life. Right. And that... She went upstairs to do whatever she went to go do. Mm -hmm. And it, and I was still outside with the guys that were gangsters, so on and so forth. And then she came back and got me. At the time, I didn't know what she was doing now that as an adult. I'm yeah. like, oh, wow, this is what she was doing. She had money. She didn't have money before she went upstairs. Mm -hmm. And she had money now. So it made me say, how do you treat a woman now? You get what I'm saying to you? Yeah. Because yeah, how she's treating herself. Transaction or how she's treating herself. Well, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So now, now, as an older man, right? And not now, but at one time. <laughs> she was growing. Yeah, as I've been growing. I'm not opposed to tricking. Okay. You get what I'm saying yeah, to you? Yeah, tricking if you got it. Right, so. right. So, but I don't know if that idea comes from mm -hmm. that one situation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I remember me shooting hoops in the park and my mother come and give me a kiss. She On this block that I'm from, mm -hmm. the block that I'm from on 20th, if people see this interview, they're going to know when I'm from 20th and, you know what I mean, not Avenue and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a trick box. It's like a whole stroll. It's like 100 tricks out here. Oh, that's selling that. Pussy. That's like Guilford and Hoover. Right. So it's like the same thing. You know, so they, that, they out here selling the tuna. Mm -hmm. She had come walk from over there. I'm shooting hoops in the park. The people here know that, that mm -hmm. she's doing it. And she had come kiss me. So do you think that there's something to your, like, self-esteem or how people view you? I think at one point it was. Mm -hmm. I think now. That's probably why I don't care no as much. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't. I don't. People are like you saying the wildest stuff. Mm -hmm. You do the craziest stuff. I don't care as much because who I am is who I am. I'm going to die like die this that way. That's true. And but the thing is, that's what I guess that's what made me successful as well, though. Like you know, financially, like um, you know, I own a couple of businesses. I own homes. I did it early. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I lost a couple hundred thousand dollars three, four times in my lifetime. Like even right now, this past eighteen months. I lost a quarter million dollars off bad investments and some street stuff. You know what I mean? That I'm not gonna get into no, it. You because, know I mean, so first of all, I want to say first of all, being open and vulnerable and sharing that with me. So I, and people who are going to see this because it takes a lot for a man to admit certain things that happen with them with their parent. Right. My only thing is for you is I just want you to completely heal from that, and it will take time. That's gonna take it a will lot take of time. time. I just feel like we shouldn't just the only thing I just 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 us as guys mm -hmm. we shouldn't just solely blame my mother because where was my what's my father? Your father. At? People both hold equal ones, but like that's, you that's said, what I'm saying. And I said in the beginning, a mother plays this role 
in a father place than this. Right, man. right. So all I can say is for you, from a woman, from a mother, gotcha. from a different aspect, for a man, seeing your hole and seeing where you're bleeding at. Like, I see it. Like, right. You can't sit up here and tell me. That's why I asked you in between. I said, wait a minute, let's stop there. Right. We have to. Yes, we hold the man accountable 100%. 100%. It takes two to make a baby. But as far as a woman, I can only speak on a woman aspect. Gotcha. So I want to sit up here and say thank you for being vulnerable enough to even share that. Right. I see that you're hurting. From yeah, a yeah. woman who has mother issues too. And I got daddy issues. Right, so right. So that's why I asked you. Right, right, right. And I appreciate that too. That's why I asked And I, you know what it is? And, and it's real too that you're saying this to me. Like, you know, having conversations like now, my mother is like in a home. You know what I mean? She's, she's young. She's only 55. Mm hmm. And she she barely she got to use a walker to walk, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like I said, she been dealing with uh, HIV for over twenty plus years. Mm -hmm. Um, having these conversations with her, just you know, I'm being I'm still being there for you know what I mean? I don't really I try my yeah I try not to really like hold no you know what I mean? My heart is if you do me right, I'm gonna do you excellent. Mm -hmm. But if you do me wrong though. You know what I mean? Then you're gonna get a different version of me. Demons. Right. But then you also have to think about where. But you do I should should I accept that though? You have to. I feel like that's where the Go problem. Go ahead, take your drink. Take that's your where drink. the problem comes. Take your out. drink. I'm gonna tell you why you have to, right? I can accept it if you take accountability, but the, if you don't take accountability, I can't accept it. But you can't make a person take accountability. They can't see. And you what can't they make did me wrong. stand next to you if you can't see that. But who is it hurting more to keep that built up anger in? No, it's just not that. It's not hurting me more because now I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go on my way. And I'm gonna cut the relationship off, and I'm gonna go do therapy. Yeah, you gonna go through therapy. <laughs> I'm gonna, you gonna go do cry. all that, but it's still in my house. Oh, you gonna cry. Uh, now I'm just saying <laughs> it's, it's not gonna be an issue no more once I release it. I you just don't gotta release it with it. you. You don't have to release it with her. But at the end of the day, it's more better to forgive another person for their own demons because, like we said, our life path. And as you get older, I don't know if you have children. Yeah, I do. I got two daughters. Like that, right? I tell my kids all the time. I always say, I ain't gonna never be like this, and I ain't gonna do that. I'm gonna do this with my kids and just in the third. But when they have their children, guess what? They are gonna say the same damn thing about me. I ain't gonna never do this that my mother did, or well, vice versa. My kids told me they might never saw you cry. Ain't that crazy? Right. Right. When you're a woman. To be 36 years old and I'm a woman, they ain't never see me cry. Right. That's a problem. But I got I, I think that you might think it's a problem, but as a man, I don't think. You know, I because said, you're a man because you know saying y'all not supposed to. Nah, not just that. You know it's a saying they used to be saying when we was younger. That's Shut a lot of people. Up. Don't they, nobody want you, you cry. You're a boy. Nah, not that the saying used to be like they used to be like, yo, if you cry, then what the kids gonna do? Oh, my <laughs> you remember that when we was younger? You, yes. So in my mind, so I, and you probably a single mom, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you're a single mom. I am now, yeah. So if you're a single mom, mm -hmm. there ain't no time to cry. You gotta pay these bills, you but gotta work two that? jobs. Make you gotta, it right. It That's not healthy. It, it makes it realistic. It makes it realistic because of what we are opposed to, but crying still doesn't make it realistic either because we want people to be in touch with their feelings. That's why we go out here and make irrational decisions. That's why you said the first eight years of your marriage, you was on some shit. Not my marriage, I'm just well, being my woman. Yeah, you're relationship. Married, your woman. Yeah, I've been married. I've been my woman for twelve years, right? I've been married for three of those twelve years, mm -hmm. and that's that go. And but I've been engaged for three years before that, mm -hmm. two and a half, three years before that. So you know, what I'm saying it's been obviously. I knew she was the one mm -hmm. six years. You know what I mean? Before this last, you know what I mean? We yeah. on our third year. Um, but other than that, other women was disposable to you, correct? I mean, I'm just asking. Come on now. I've been with over 300 plus women in my lifetime. That's right? about average for men. Right, average, right? So, I, and, that, and I would say. I know that, people like, is that average? But trust me, that it's I, average. I hang around a lot of dudes and got a lot of male friends. And right. trust me. Right. And I, I would say, I would say, uh, I've been in probably three or four relationships in my life. Mm -hmm. um, all of them value was, were different, mm -hmm. right? And then most women that I ever even slept with still today keep in contact with me because I got a thing. Like, I don't, uh, I never really, dis I don't disrespect no one. Even when I was in high school, when I was a little kid, when I was young, and they'd be like, oh, this person a hoe, oh, that person a hoe, so on and so forth. I never really was that guy. Like, I don't really like, that ain't really my thing. You know what I'm saying? I don't really be like, oh, this person's this. I'm, so I never really was known for that. that. ethical slut, but it's okay. Right. So when I was, when I was a juvenile, young, child, mm -hmm. females used to be like, yo, don't bring him around. He's mad aggressive. <laughs> right? I don't get that from you, but go on. Yeah, I'm a different guy than you know now. Mm. So when I said I'm mad aggressive, not that I'm grabbing him or touching him. No. Just my conversation is crazy. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. And they'd be considered as disrespectful. It's because I was trying to hide who I was. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. And some women liked it. I didn't know that some women like honesty at that rate. 
at that age. Like, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to have sex. Yeah, so what? I'm 16. So surprised. You know what I mean? How far you'll get with just saying this is what it is instead of playing the mind games. Right, right. So as I got older, I started. I st always been remain real and I always had those conversations just a little bit more swifter, a little bit more leaner. And then I understood what I had. So I've been. I had money three, four different times in my life. I had 19, mm -hmm. 25, 32, still now. Still. You know what I'm saying? So. I knew how I always I had not always had money, but I didn't. I started hustling young, you thirteen, to fourteen okay. years old. Yeah, it's been not just not just trick, but just understand how to optimize the situation. I got my own money. I don't need you for anything. Mm -hmm. So if I don't need you for anything, then this conversation can only be transactional. Mm. Until I feel like I love you. So how different. long did you think it take for you to realize that about a person that it became more to you love them? Because cancers, I I will say this, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Right. Most cancers they fall quickly. You think so? I think. I don't so. know. You know what it is with me? I don't think I fall quickly. I just be like, if somebody take their guards down with me, mm -hmm. and I take my guards down with you, mm -hmm. I be can read people a little quick. I feel like. Mm -hmm. So if it, if it's if it's honest and if it's genuine, then we can make steps on day one. Okay. I'm, my wife I'm with now, I had sex with her the first day we hung out. Mm -hmm. Not the first day I met her, but the first day we hung out, we had sex. She's my wife. Yeah, that happens. There's yeah. no limit. I'm yeah. just simply saying to you that obviously we vibed. There was a bond there. Mm -hmm. that It took years to grow from there. And we had our moments like a mother, like, like a, you know what I mean? But we got there. Mm -hmm. Most women that I, I've been with, you know what I mean, has been probably... Like, no, I'm not gonna say this because that's that's wrong. What I was about to say. No, but, uh, you say exactly what you. And I was about to say easy fuck, but I'm not trying to say easy fuck. It was just. It was more like beneficial. You would say that for the person they thought they was getting something. You said transactional. It was like all right, the vibe. It, it was. It's a little bit stuff. of all three of those things. Okay. You know, okay. vibe, I transactional, and beneficial. I can see that. You get what I'm saying? So if if I'm dealing with a woman at a certain stage, at a certain pace, at a certain time, mm -hmm. um. If I'm able to provide at this point, obviously you can you can tell that you can look at me and tell I'm able to provide, right? So you'll see me like, in some cases, honey. In I some cases, know. let me think. So I'm, I think personally, if you see me, you'd be like, yeah, bro, bro, because I do this. Thing. But you, but by the time you already seen me, you might not even ever spoke to me in life. Mm -hmm. But you might just follow me on Instagram. You'll see how I live. So boom, you see how this dude lived. Just, when, I put it up. I put it up. You see how my condo look. Obviously, I can pay for this, right? My children. You see my children, how my children live. You see my how my wife live, right? Mm -hmm. But that don't mean I'm going to provide that Wait, for, you. for you. So everybody that's listening to this right now, just because you see what he got going on at home, it does not mean it will be for you. But in some cases, it could yeah. be. But we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, okay? Listen. She's talking that real, real. Listen, you don't know about that ethical slut diary. Talk Again. to me. So, you know what I mean? It's just it's just a whole different type of thing. Um, but when it comes, let me re revert back to what you were talking about. When it comes to back, am I damaged? Am I not healed? Yeah, I'm still not healed. Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to women, um, do I try to move forward and be the best version of myself as I possibly can for my family, for my wife, for my children? Absolutely. So, what is the best version of yourself? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, I what guess does that look like? That looked like me waking up five thirty six in the morning, getting my kids ready for school, making their, their lunch and their breakfast okay. for them to go to school. For me driving my wife off to work, and me paying for eighty five percent of the bills that's in the household. Me um, just just having these conversations that that you need to grow. Yeah. Just as a man, that means more. And then me um, learning your love language, understanding what you want mm -hmm. as a woman, and then me talking to my children understanding who they need to be and what their responsibilities are mm -hmm. and who I am in that and what role I play in them growing. In that going. So given the fact that your father wasn't present, your grandfather died early, how do you think that affected you being a parent? I think it made me want to be, I think it, it helped me. I think it made me want okay. to be a better, like it made, it made me challenge myself to be better. Mm -hmm. Not and, and I think that's why um, the universe didn't breast me with a son yet because I probably would have been more harder on him. Mm -hmm. But my daughter's, they called me daddy. Is always I don't want it. They was at their grandmother's house like yesterday. Right. Spending out the grandmother's house. Daddy, I don't want to eat. Um, what's she making? <laughs> can, I, can I get pizza? Can you order me pizza? And what you do? Send uh, the pizza. Yeah, I ordered the pizza Suck from up. DoorDash. You know what I mean? My daughter, my oldest is nine, my youngest is seven. Suck it's up. my youngest calling my baby. Oh, 
Sokka. Yeah, and he, my youngest look like me. Big Sokka. cheeks, a little heavy, oh. little. You know what I'm saying? So it's like. Oh. So she looked good. You know what I'm I saying? understand. I understand. So I'm, understand. You know what I mean? I'm going to go Brothers get... Brothers like that with their boys. We love our daughters. Right. It's there, but our boys, is just different about them. I, I, can't, I can't shake it, so I understand. So I, it's what I'm going to do. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so I sent them the food. Boom, boom. Then today they called me. They said, Daddy, I don't... They called me this early in the morning. I, I didn't come home last night, right? So mm-hmm. I spent a night... Because this is two hours away, Yeah. my man lived closer here to here. He lives like an hour and a half away from here, mm-hmm. opposed to two and a half hours away. That's true. So, and we was watching fights at his house anyway last night. It made sense. To stay at his house. Mm-hmm. I said, bro, I'm not going back home. I told my wife, she's like, oh, she don't care. She know, you know what I mean? Just like my brother, she ain't really, you know what I mean? Tripping his wife, he married. You know what I'm saying? She know what it is. It's all men here. It ain't no, you feel me? Air mattress. Long story she short, said, yeah, I'm slipping on the air mattress. Long <laughs> she, she and she see me, she Facetime. You ain't, you know what I mean? She know I ain't on no bullshit. His wife ain't having so it. So the anyway. trust is there. Yeah, we always been. You, she know I'm not on no bullshit. You know what I mean? I'm be on some real shit. And then if I'm, I'm, and I'm an extreme individual. So I'm an extreme honesty type of dude. So if I cheat on you, your feelings about to be hurt because I'm about to have a conversation with you about it. Mm. And then whatever happens from here it happens. So you don't believe in open relationships? What you mean believe in them? I'm asking. Do you? Like, would I want my wife to be fucking another guy? I'm not asking. I said open. I'm just talking about period in general. Nobody's not putting no big dick in my wife. <laughs> no I'm out here with a regular six and a half. You know what I mean? Seven on my best Lord, day. that's not what uh, I said. Uh, on my best day. I don't want nobody <laughs> out here pulling out the eight and a half, nine that's on my wife. I said. You feel me? She had bigger dicks in her life, but it's their better dick. I it's said, different. Open relationship. Nobody's not, not fucking my it. wife. Okay. All right, but they can that's fuck you. To- what you know, men? You no, not about? men. I'm just I'm saying. Not, like, I don't what? do that. No disrespect to what nobody else got going on. No, that's not what I'm Nobody's saying. not fucking my, I'm not telling nobody's fucking me neither. I'm not okay. saying that neither. I was asking about over relationships. Oh, I was asking about Polly. Do you guys participate in that situation? Or Hell you're no. Completely monogamous. I'm completely monogamous. Okay. My wife and I be, I tried to, we was in DR just a year ago. My man got married. I was trying to get her to let me get some pussy, but uh, let me. Uh, and she was like, you get the fuck I want. Let me get a threesome. She was not beat. I feel on that girl. I talk hella shit, but I don't think I could ever do it. And she had one before with a guy before me. You know what I mean? She but probably mad. She gonna she gonna hit us and be mad. She'll cuss you the hell out. Don't yeah, yeah. Tell me my fucking business. But you I'm like husband. motherfucker, you don't had a thing before me, <laughs> motherfucker. Let me get one. But your husband, you? husband is a different. Yeah, fuck that nigga, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> But right, that's, go. <laughs> I'm sorry, wife. I, let's told, go. Let's I go. told you this is gonna be a wild I one. I talk it, crazy. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, so let's let's go. A little bit forward, right? Y'all right. Back to Irvington, y'all couldn't afford, like you couldn't play other sports, mm-hmm. tennis shoes and things like that. So what sparked you to go into the streets? What made you be like, you know what? I know I can't get it from home because of all the other responsibilities. I need to go outside and get it. Right. So before I went to the foster home, um, they sent us to Philly for a summertime to my aunt house. We stood in Philly for a summertime. and. Mm-hmm. I was young. I was probably like 10 or 11, and I was seeing dudes running around, and they brought me back towards the end of the summer, and then the, the gang culture started coming in, like 97, the end of 97, beginning of 98, in my area, mm-hmm. and it was Crips and Bloods, but mainly just Crips in my area. There's no Bloods at all. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it started coming in, in my area. We started seeing different things, woo, 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 and I couldn't afford different things, and I'm finding myself, damn, I'm having fights. I'm arguing with dudes because I'm not able to afford these different mm-hmm. things. So I'm like, yo, bro, can I sit, can I hustle? And they like, yeah, come on, get some. I'm 11, 12, so I start hustling for niggas. And I'm outside hustling with me and my cousin. We just doing what we do. We selling drugs. We hustling, doing mm-hmm. what we're supposed to be doing. And it goes from there to niggas bringing me home crib. Niggas jump me. They bring me home crib, mm-hmm. so on and so forth. And then, it's, then you know, like I said, my mother's outside in the streets. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'm, only my grandmother's here. It's like, who loves you really? Even though my, it's... I grew up, this was the part that I, I, I be skipping, like, in my house at the time, it was five or six adults, maybe five adults. It was my grandmother, my mother, my aunt Stacy, my uncle Rob, and my aunt Ann. So it's five adults, mm-hmm. right? But it's 12 children or 10, 12 children in a three-bedroom apartment. All right. You know what I mean? So we all, how are you going to be able to, how my grandmother going to be able to, to all... Afford that. The ch- not just afford it, just to be able to have to give me the the conversations that I may need to have the information to give me the you know what I mean that that I might need as a so child the, the information and I got it from the streets. So that was my first introduction from the streets. And then shortly, then my grandmother died, 
in May, mm. May 1st of 1998. Mm. May 1st of 1998, I, my birthday, and I was born 86, I'll be 12 mm. in um, July. They shipped me off to my cousin's house. He lived with white people. His life was different, and they kind of adopted me. And then I went to Bayonne, and so like a white neighborhood, but it was still like dudes in that neighborhood. That still did what they. That did. was from Jersey City and other areas. That was but just that was in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I wound up bringing the gang culture that I got from there okay. over there, mm -hmm. and I made the life not no, unknowingly. I'm making life harder for myself. Mm -hmm. So at 16, I get emancipated because the people over here, the white people and the, the one black guy was like, bro, yo, you too, you, mm -hmm. you like a grown man, you can't be here with us no more. So then I got my own apartment. I'm 16 years old, my own apartment. I get a vehicle. I got a job at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I got two jobs. I'm working at Morallo Paint. I'm working at McDonald's and I'm selling drugs in the school to the white people. Mm -hmm. I did the same thing. Yeah. And so you kind of got similar stories. So I'm doing all this right here. I got my own apartment. Then I started getting, I get my own vehicle. And then now I'm outside just differently. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Not knowing that they was trying to help me. You know what I mean? Shouts out to my Uncle Jimmy. Not, shouts out hey, to the other white guys. What's up? He was trying to help me. You know what I mean? But you was in survival mode at that time. At that time. Yeah. That, that's how my mindset went. Mm -hmm. And I just was on different type of time. So fast forward three years later, 2005 come around. You know what I mean? I can't pay my bills now. I'm still a child. I'm mm -hmm. like 18 or 19 years old. Mm -hmm. So I got to try to go back to live with my mother. Mm -hmm. My mother, uh, she kind of got herself together at this time. You okay. know what I mean? She kind of like, you know what I mean? Was strong. She was like, um, at the time, like somebody, like I think HUD or something was paying for her to stay there mm -hmm. and they couldn't have no felons or in the house. nobody. And That's I was, true. and I had just grabbed, came home. I just was locked up a little bit and I just took a, de a deal, not knowing that I'm taking a deal. This is a felony. Because you wasn't educated enough. That's normally what they right. do. Right. Mm -hmm. So I took a deal, situation, whatever. So I had to go live in the shelter for like three or four months. At the time, I'm living in the shelter. I worked at Morallo Paint, the same place I was working at in high school. I worked at Target, mm -hmm. right? And then I was selling drugs because I was trying not to go to sleep inside the shelter. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that apartment that I had, I gave my mother all the furniture, the beds, whatever I could. That what I did have there. And I was just standing there. And she was like, man, fuck all that, bro. Just come stay with me. Mm -hmm. After three or four months, she's like, just come stay. So now I move my stuff there. I'm staying there. And then I'm outside on the streets. I'm catching cases. I'm shooting people. I'm robbing niggas. I'm gangbanging. And I'm making money. I'm going to jail. But it's a cycle. It just it's a cycle. It repeats. It repeats. Yeah, it's a rinse cycle. I'm just repeating. It's mm -hmm. just starting to come full cycle. It wasn't until I was 26 or 27 years old. Where I was like, all right, bro, I gotta try to do something different. I'm getting locked up because niggas is turning their back on me. I feel like niggas is turning their back on me. Niggas, I don't put money in their pockets, right, so on and so forth. And put you in a different um, lifespan. And then all right. You know, now I'm locked up and these niggas don't wanna give me nothing. So I'm like, yo, I gotta, shit gotta change. You know what I mean? So at 26, what made you stop and just think for a second, like, I have to change this because everybody started abandoning you? Or was it like, I'm tired of this lifestyle? And people abandoning me, and I just need to figure something else out. You know, I just met my woman right at that time too, okay. and then I was locked up. A nigga was tell when I was locked up, an old head was like, "Bro, you moving like a lifer." I'm like, "What you mean?" He was like, "Bro, you know, I got 30 years in here." He was telling me, he said, "You moving like how I was moving before I got all this time." Mm -hmm. He's like, "Bro, if you keep moving how you moving like this, and I'm only here. I on this last time I was locked up, not the last time, the time before the last time I got locked up." He was like, "Yo." You keep moving like this, bro. You're going to be in here with us forever. Mm. And I was like, I can't be in here forever like no. this. You know what I mean? I ain't never been down state prison. I've only been like 18 months here, nine months here, seven months here. I ain't never been five years or seven, nothing like that, three years. And I'm like, damn, bro. So I got to switch it up. You know That's what I mean? I so, that, so a lot of people don't know, like, even though you might not take the, the information at that moment or when you come home immediately and apply it, over time, it kind of, you know what I mean? Okay. And so over time, I kind of applied that. I met my woman. At the time, I had another woman, too, at the, at the time. So <laughs> I was with a woman. I was with a woman named Lawanda. Lawanda, she probably, I hope she hear this, and she, she was a great woman. Okay. You know what I mean? And and she wasn't as beautiful as my other woman, mm -hmm. right? As my, the woman, I'm, the wife I'm with now, right? And she was a good woman. She did a thing, but I just, 
I shitted on her, you know what I mean? I was cheating on her, so on and so forth. I did a lot of bullshit to her, you know what I mean? At least you can admit it. And I did a lot of bullshit to her. And, and um, in that process of doing bullshit to her, you know, she she was just everything that I really needed in life. She um, she spoke two different languages, you know what I mean? She she was a college graduate at the time. She Her father worked for the feds. Um, he was like... He owned property. Mm-hmm. He was like, you know what I mean? And then she did things for me. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not going to put a business out there now. No, no, point. Probably married. no point at all. Yeah, but she did things for me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? When I needed to bail out of jail, she did things for me and, and you know what I mean, risk things. And, and that I wouldn't actually help bail me out of jail. When I was younger, 19, 20, you know what I mean? 22, 24. She was like around there for those times. And, um, and, we was in a place where she was going to Korea mm-hmm. to teach kids how to speak, you know, English, so on and so forth. She was progressing, and I was doing bullshit to her, you know what I mean? So obviously she was only right, like, yo, I'm leaving. Like, yeah, I'm not about to stay here with the bullshit you put putting up with you. And she left, and we kept communication for a little bit while I was still with my wife. My wife found out she deaded it, okay. you know what I mean, early 2011. And then, you know, I never really spoke to her since maybe 2011, 2012. Um, I would say that the development and emancipation of myself came not just from one person, not just from one experience, but the totality of it all. Yeah, and I, and I feel like um, it wasn't just one thing to say to myself, man, I shouldn't be doing this. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should. And then, you know, right or wrong is a gray areas inside that. Yeah, li- listen. You know what I mean? So if I feel like I got to rob you to feed me and my children, mm-hmm. then am I really wrong? On the flip side, you can be, but on the other side, I have to survive. Right, right. So that's why I say in survival moment, and the fact that you and LaWanda, I think you said that was her name. Yeah. It was a teaching moment, not only for yourself, but also for her, right? Got you. What is her standards? What is she going to allow herself to? And then she had to develop things about herself. Right. When we allow other people to become our saving grace or take advantage of us or do things of that, because typically that's what you did. You took advantage. And it wasn't because you were a bad guy. You were in survival mode. Right. But what you did was use survival tactics on someone who was just vulnerable and wanted to be loved. Right, right. If that makes sense. Got you, yeah. So I'm here to tell you, like, okay, yeah, you fucked up. But most men and most women do. I ain't always perfect either. Right, trust right. Me. And I, and I don't have no. I don't have no. Like I don't have no. Like in my life, like I don't have no. Like did somebody wrong type of stories besides her. Like I, because I, I, I live certain way. Like, even as a child, I only I live certain way. You, I only do things like I'm on, I'm reactionary. Like you, order for me to do something wrong to you. You have to do something. You gotta do something wrong to me. I don't do nothing to nobody. Like my heart pure. Mm-hmm. I want to love everybody. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, I, I took a boxing because the white boys, I couldn't beat the white boys when I was in the foster home. They was fucking me up. Mm-hmm. So my, was take boxing up. So I know how to defend myself. Fight. Right, I was so doing. So do you always think you want to defend yourself more? Do you think like for the rest of your life, why are you invest into like properties and your business and start rapping? Do you think most of those things was just for you to defend yourself so you can seem stronger, superior type of thing? I think the music just saved my life. That's, the, that's one of the real reasons why I stopped kind of like people didn't want to do with the music. I was so interested into the music early 2006, 2007. And niggas didn't want to come in with me and they want to put the money up with me to do the studios. And they was like, what the fuck you mean? You a rapper. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say this and I'm not, I don't want to say this. At the time, I'm, I'm edging towards a kingpin drug dealer. I'm 19 years old, mm-hmm. 2006. I'm edging towards a kingpin drug dealer. Like I'm, I'm, I'm on that echelon. Yeah, like I'm, I'm on, I got a whole block, 30 something people hustling for me on the block. You know what I'm saying? I'm edging towards that. I'm making 20 grand a week. Trust me, I understand. So the quicker you get it, the quicker it becomes. Right. And and at the time I'm edging towards that, I want the guys that's working for me to come to the studio with me. But then I'm not, and then they're not coming to support Can't take me like that. With you. But then when they're not coming to the support me, I'm so aggressive, I feel offended by it. So I'm saying crazy mm-hmm. shit to them. I'm getting them out of my way. I'm cutting their water off. I don't want them to come. Mm-hmm. Don't be around me. Then you can't get no money with me. Mm-hmm. And that's stupid. I was like I was that. wrong for doing that. I understand. I shouldn't have, but because my dream is my dream. That's not your dream. I shouldn't have been doing that. But again, sometimes when you want to see people push forward and go where they want to go, you want them to go with you. You can't understand. So if you ain't with me, that means you're against me. Right. And that's where you were in your life. So let's fast forward up because we running out of time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love it. And I love this yeah. conversation. Right. We're going to fast forward to what sparked you to go ahead, boom. We're going to do a podcast. 
All right, so this is what happened. We're going to fast forward, right, to, uh-huh. to the good shit. Yeah, because you know I like to go deep. Make All right. Dry. So I'm going to be honest. 2019 going to 2020, I said, yo, I seen these, these uh, my wife and them, they got a podcast. I'm going to be honest. My wife and them, they got a podcast. They had a podcast at the time. It was going crazy. Before, before me, before anything was going on, they was like about to start doing their podcast. And I'm like, yo, um, let me be your manager. They was like, nah. <laughs> I'm like, damn, let me. So I'm like, uh, I'm like, out of good faith, I'm gonna pay for your logo. So it's four of them. I paid for their logo. You know, I'm gonna pay for the logo, and then, we'll, then, then I got my own space now. Mm-hmm. I went to the space that they was going to, right? They was going to a space similar to this, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm a different type of guy, right? So I seen them going to the space. I went to the space. I said, let me get a podcast. I owned the barbershop at the time. Mm-hmm. I took the guys to the barbershop. I said, I'm gonna bring you to the space. And I asked the guy how much is it a month. I pay him whatever his monthly fee was. And I sat there every week. I wasn't on the camera or nothing. And I just seen what he was doing. I seen what equipment he had, so on and so forth. So now 2020 came. I went and bought my own equipment. I went and bought everything he had. I moved my podcast from where he was at to, to my space. I'm renting the space out. So I stole I stole their shit. You didn't steal. You just was inspired. Go I inspired. So now. <laughs> so, but I said, this, this guy's doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. It was a lady, him and a lady doing it together. I'm like, they doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. They still thinking they have radio going because it was a radio station. It was a podcast. I said, they this podcast is the new thing. It ain't over. Fuck them. It so, took over radio. Yeah, it was taking over. I said, fuck that. What they doing? That's stupid. I took them. The pod that I had, I put them on air. I created another podcast with T Rob mm-hmm. and my cousin Chuck. Okay. So now they got a they got a sports podcast now and a barbershop podcast. I put it out there and I ran ads through both of the podcasts. People started contacting me. Mm-hmm. How can we come on and get our own podcast? I charged them X amount of dollars four times a week. I mean, four times a month, once a week at the same time at a price. But in order for me to get this jumping really crazy, they was doing cool with their podcast, right? Because mm-hmm. I'm just kind of jumping the gun. They was doing cool with their podcast. I said, I'm going to do my own podcast. As you should. So I did my own podcast with my videographer and my audio engineer. Mm-hmm. So now it's us three up, 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 up there. But more. Now, as soon as it started going crazy, people started hitting me. Mm-hmm. So, so now, in the next two months, from January to March, I got 16, 17 podcasts here. That's giving me X amount of dollars a month, four times a month, at the same time, in the same space. So I, I did, that's when I built the company, 10,000 hours the network. So now I got a company that's providing podcast space and an opportunity to be heard. To be heard, mm-hmm. and I, and giving you good quality footage, quality audio, mm-hmm. and I'm separating the two for the two, and I'm putting it together for you so you can do what you ever you want to do. Before people was on streaming platforms, mm-hmm. I was giving them the where opportunities where you could be. 2020, I was the first one. Nobody was doing that yet. Mm-hmm. Who had a um, a network for podcasts to come and do other pod? Nobody was there yet. Mm-hmm. Nobody in no in no cities. It was just all radio type of stuff. So I was one of the first pioneers in that in the whole country. Because mm-hmm. people across the country was hitting me. I was doing that. I was providing that situation. Um, them guys couldn't take it, not say they couldn't take it serious, but business is business. I told you my audio my videographer, Baby. I hooked them with my guy identity. My guy identity had connections with other places that I was dealing with. So he went with Lola. And then from Lola, he's still with her right now, my videographer. Okay. My audio engineer, we own a music studio. We do fucking four or five hours a, a day mm-hmm. for him to record audio. He don't got time for a podcast. That is true. So I said, yo, what am I going to do? How am I going to, you know what I mean, get this podcast? The music started to slow up for me. Mm-hmm. It ain't The streams ain't coming in as, as it once was. Things ain't moving like it once was. Mm-hmm. So I said, yo, podcast seems to be my next business for me personally to go in. I called the homie GL. I'm like, yo, bro, what's up, bro? What you doing? He's like, I'm chilling, bro. I'm out of my work, which was good. I said, yo, bro, let's, um, I got a podcast. I want to call it. I got, it's either, let me go even call it Beards and Bottles or something and something else. Mm-hmm. He's like, I like Beards and Bottles. That's dope. I said, all right, so that's the one we're going to go with then. If, that, if you like that one, we're going to go with Beards and Bottles. That's if that's okay. what you like that one, you know what I mean? Because we didn't go with the other one I presented him. I said, all right, bro, um, uh, you know, I got all the equipment. I own the production. I own everything. I'm like, so I'm just going, he's like, what you mean? I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna come on. We're gonna do just like two or three episodes and see what happens. Boom, boom, boom. 
and I tricked him. And we didn't want <laughs> you tricked him. And next thing you know, yeah, we in 60, we 61 episodes y'all in. 61 episodes in. And, and you know I what I mean? I love that for y'all. I, I really do. It. So where do you see beers and bottles in the next five years? Ah, that's a great question. So, you know, right now, uh, we we got like maybe eight or ten sponsors. Mm -hmm. We like we got some nice sponsors coming in right now. Um, I think we're gonna be um, the leading platform for the guys that want to speak genuinely. Yes. And like in the next couple, because we we have no holes bars here. We not I'm not controlled by no one. I'm like a smaller version of a Joe Button podcast because he owned the rights to everything. That's true. So I'm kind of the same thing. You know what I mean? GL owned Port Parts as well to the um to the actual beards and bottles. He don't own the production, but he definitely owned to beards and bottles. You know what I mean? So he's you know what I mean? We 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 control everything. Okay. You know what so I mean? How would you tell other platforms that not platforms, podcasters who want to be on your network? You said you own the network. Let people know how would they hit you up? How would you say, hey, I got these many, we'll just say digital impact for whatever. They like, all right, it's a lot of podcasts that come out of this studio right here and the other one right. we have. How would they be on your network? How would you market that? How would you tell them? How could they go about it? They see you, they see this show, they'd be like, oh shit, he has his own network. It's black owned. It's men. How do you move forward with that? Uh, so I could, I'm going I'm to tell you, I'm going to try to give you um, the outline without giving them the game. Of course. Because if I give them all the game, then it's free. True. But I would say this, DM me for one. Um, after you DM me for one, um, we will figure out what you want to do and how you want to do it, mm -hmm. and what I can provide, and um, how can how can we point you in the right direction where you can grow your audience into the spaces where you need it to be. Facts. Like you know what I mean. That's kind of what I do. Is I do I go above and beyond. It's kind of like, you know, PR work is a different thing. Yes, it is. You know what I mean? So I'm not really PR, but mm -hmm. when you're dealing with certain people and you want to see them grow because they're on your network, so you want you want them to grow on your network, I try to give them the most information you, as I can. But people don't understand that information is only that, information. Everything else, you got to go and do with it. That is true. You got to have your own money mm -hmm. to put into ads. You got to go travel. People don't know this. I'm going to give you out a game. Anybody that's trying to do be a new podcaster, grow, I'm going to even give it to you because you may not know. You may know. Anybody that's a new podcaster, right, that's trying to grow and trying to, like, really grow their audience just to be on podcasts, right, mm -hmm. what you do is you try to do 10 podcasts a month. Mm -hmm. But it got to be developing podcasts that's growing, that's going forward, that's moving up. It, it can have 200 followers, but if you can see, you have a foresight to see them growing, you got to jump on that podcast. You know what I mean? You got to jump on 10 podcasts a month, every month for a year. Mm -hmm. As many as you can. I'm going to say, just not, oh, not say 10, just as many as you can. And it's going to grow your podcast network because they know you for one thing. This thing they know you for. Mm -hmm. Oh, we know he be on a podcast. He be on different pod, And you can see how many podcasts you can get on to grow your audience. Not only is now, as you're growing, you're going to be helping audiences grow and vice versa. Mm-hmm. I don't care if they have five people that's going to follow you. That's yeah, true. But it got to be a growing audience. Mm -hmm. So take your yourself, your personal self, and grow a different audience. That's why you probably in your head like, damn, why GL not here? Why GL ain't moving mm -hmm. there? Because now they see me and him as one. Yeah, they do. And I'm obviously, I'm the A mic. Mm -hmm. So if they see me more often, they're going to they follow. They're going to follow. Mm -hmm. That's why I contacted you and not him. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I get it. I get it. Trust me. I totally get it. All right, right. But what I want to say is we have to do a part two. Part two. We got to. Because I want to dive more deep into you and your grandmother. Right. I want to dive deep more into when you did do gangbanging, what affected you, where is your outcomes, where is they coming. I'm just dropping little things like that. Right, right. So you want me to come see you or you come see me or both, we make it happen. We're going to make it happen. Because I'm not playing no Hollywood talk me. I said we're going to make it happen. Oh, okay. Yeah, I came down here when I said I was coming down here, right? I just want to make sure. Yeah, I don't, you know what it is, man? I just... um. All my life, even as a young, what I say is what I do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. I try to just recently. You know what I mean? Uh, somebody was in my DM. They was offended by something I said because they I quoted them wrong. Mm -hmm. And they was like, "Could you take down that what's name? Because you quoted me wrong." And I took it down. That's what you know what I'm saying because I quoted them wrong, even though the, it was it was going crazy. It was going crazy. But I quoted, quoted them wrong, wrong, and I'm just I'm just real on just who I am. 
Well, I will say is I've been a huge supporter since it's been sent to me. And I appreciate it. I tune in all the time. And I'm not just saying that because we have mutual friends and right. everybody cool. If it was trash, trust me, I would be like, I can't listen to this shit. Let me tell right, you. Right, right, right. Cool, but I ain't going to be able to do it. And I have shot y'all out before on other platforms. I appreciate you. Uh, especially on my brother's show. It's called the Raw Dope Podcast. Where Raw Dope. All Follow that. People from all over. And he was like, what's your top 10 podcasts? And I named y'all. I don't oh, really I like, that. I don't really shout out people like I already know they got the game but I shout out people who have a message and y'all podcast was one of them that I did say and I also said ladies pitch y'all should you should um, check them out as you know who ladies pitch ladies pitch ladies they're pitch. really good chilling with juice and then you know well Jose I am on that one that's when I be real like yeah like two husbands type of shit All right. um, <laughs> shout out for the most part but I just shout out y'all because I like what y'all have and what you're standing for right. I see the difference in the dynamic between you and GL right. like how you like alright let me hear the back story GL like alright what's going on present and I love how you guys come together I want you to keep up the good work I am so amazed by my black man being able to speak out and really shed light on different people's lifestyles and not only your own right. so I want to thank you for being vulnerable with me within this time within this session and I'm so sorry we got to end it because I have so many more questions Right, right. so many more things that I want to go it is what it is but we will continue to grow together. So if you allow me to be a part of your growth process and as well as mine, I would appreciate that. That'd be for sure. We locked in now. All right. If we locked in. Ain't and it's what you know. <laughs> so give your um, handles once again so for it's everyone. So on Instagram, it's PBM underscore Louie. Um, if you want to go to the Beards and Bottles podcast, it's Beards and Bottles. And with the with the Little N podcast, you know what I mean, at gmail.com, hit us up, uh, Beards and Bottles. Uh, on Instagram as well. Um, just, just, just hit me up. I'm everywhere. I'm doing everything. Um, you want to listen to the music? Louis J L O U I E space J Y. Listen to all the music. I drop an album every month. So you know, drop them albums. Now y'all know what I me. do. At the end, I always turn like my little old lady self to the camera, and I tell y'all, today was really amazing for me. I don't know about anybody else, but for someone to stick to their word, to come to you and be vulnerable in that moment, speak about what happened to him as a child, let you know exactly what was going on with his mother issues, where he felt like maybe it's abandonment, maybe to grow in that point, I always know he wasn't the perfect gentleman, but he's able to strive. Like he said, and I always say, whatever you put your mind to, you will achieve it. If you believe it, you can do it. You can change. And it always starts with one. So with that being said, and the love from Jersey, I appreciate them and you guys. This has been another episode of the Journey of a Soul Sister. <laughs> this is a Anything Goes podcast production.